Wait, where? What? Give me the box! Oh no. No, no! Not the box. This is the Escape the Zoo Podcast. <laughs> With your host, Daniel Clark. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Escape the Zoo podcast, where we talk everything wildlife. Today's guest is Russell McLaughlin, an award-winning wildlife filmmaker, photographer, naturalist, and conservationist. He works with groups like National Geographic, Wild Aid, and Disney Nature. We talk about his new film project documenting one of the rarest animals in the world, the Black Panther, swimming with crocodiles, lemurs in Madagascar, wolves playing with bears in Scandinavia, and much, much more. Russ's work is deeply inspiring to me, and I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do too. So without further ado, here it is, my chat with the one and only Russell McLaughlin. Well, Russ, thanks so much for taking the time. I'm super stoked we finally made this happen. You are the first guest on this podcast that I've actually met in person prior to recording, which is pretty cool. We met at the Roosevelt Hotel in Hollywood. I think it was probably about three months ago now. Yeah, yeah, it it was a few months back. As somebody who has spent the better half of the last three years in the most exotic wilderness places in the world, what were your thoughts on the concrete jungle of Los Angeles? Oh man, um, it's, it's it's different. I um, <laughs> I I've I've been to Los Angeles a, a couple times now, and uh, it's it's still a place I'm trying to get used to. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I've I've got a great bunch of friends out there, so it's always nice to go catch up. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's all good. Yeah. I wanted to jump in, talk about the big project that you're working on in India. Do you mind kind of letting listeners know a little bit about what you're filming over there? Um, yeah, India. I've uh, been out in India for quite some time. Uh, we have been uh, filming a kind of a you know wildlife documentary that kind of has a, a jungle book feel. But uh, we have um, been spending majority of our time trying to track down a black leopard. Uh, people know as a black panther, but um it actually is it's a leopard oh the really the day. yeah yeah they're completely they, it's they, there is no such thing as a, as a black panther it's just a, a generic term for either black jaguar or black leopard it's yeah it's just a term and is it a certain like subspecies of the leopard or is it it's it's um it's a leopard um it's a recessive gene in in a leopard so it's it's extremely rare to find them out in the wild um Rare, like like you have no idea it's it's um, <laughs> it's a needle in a haystack just with this guy and uh, even though the forest we're working in has other leopards um he is the only black one in the forest so it doesn't it doesn't make our our, our job easy at all uh, especially with tracking him do they know when the last time there was a black leopard in that forest was in that particular forest it's never been recorded uh, wow! But in 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 other forests, in other forests in India, India, they they have been. Um. So, yeah, there's a, uh, you know, <laughs> they 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 are out there. Um. Just, just almost virtually impossible to actually go and find out in the wild. So it's a, uh, just put it this way, I never thought in my lifetime I'd ever see one in the wild. Damn. And I have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's like you know. I, I I put animals on my bucket list, and this was even on my bucket list because I knew it was impossible. <laughs> no chance. <laughs> so, That's crazy. And, and now 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 we're making a film on one, so it's a uh, pretty pretty special. Uh, I won't I won't lie. Do you uh, remember the first time you saw it? Oh yeah, yeah. The first time I saw it was um, just a, a brief glimpse of it walking through um, this very dense bush in the forest, and. Yeah, just knowing he was there, like I, I, I lost my mind. So I <laughs> completely. But every every time I've seen him, it's just something else. You have no idea. Like we've gone nearly two months without seeing him. So it just it it just shows you it is an absolute needle in the haystack. Um, he was seen a, a few days ago, and, and we head back to India uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks to resume the film. But uh, not easy. I definitely 
uh, didn't choose an easy project. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how big that forest is? So like, how hard is it to, like, once you know, okay, we found one, we didn't think it existed. Now, when you actually want to go and film it, what is that process like? I, I I'm, uh, okay, so leopards, leopards, um, their territories range quite a bit. And um, this particular leopard, he's got his own territory within an area of forest that has roads and it, which is classified as a tourism zone. And about 40% of that territory of his is in that tourism zone. And the other 60% of his territory is outside of the tourism, uh, tourism zone where there are no roads and there's no access there. So we, it's just, you, you have no idea. It's, it's luck on our side every time we find them. I mean, it, there's a lot of, um, hours and hours of just sitting there listening to the forest. And that's how you find animals in, in some of these dense forests in India. And that's how we find the tigers and, and, and the leopards in the forest is, is just purely listening to the sounds of the forest. You, you let the forest tell you what's going to happen. So you listen to the birds, you listen to the monkeys, you listen to the deer, all of them will give you a kind of whereabouts of what's actually happening so you'll know if there's a leopard in the area you'll know if there's a tiger in the area and um, because we know where his territory is we know where to start looking and listening for those sounds and it's nine out of ten times we find him because of a monkey that's seen him already and we know where he's going to come out or of a deer calling and we know where he's going to come out or something like that that's it's, crazy it's, it's, how do you develop yeah, that like how do you even is is it local people who explain like what to be listening for? Is I just assume well, that that's not something you go in and you're like you know how to do. No, no. So so in Africa we have a, a very different way of tracking, uh, just because we've you know this this forest we've got a wall of you know forest on either side of the road, so it's very very dense. As you know, as soon as the animal walks into the forest, you can't see it, mm -hmm. and it could be weeks before you see the animal again. So in Africa, as soon as the animal crosses a road, you, you'll still see it for a good distance after it's crossed the road. The bush isn't dense. You don't have, you know, these jungles like, I mean, especially in, 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 in the savanna regions of, of Africa. And that's what I grew up in. And uh, tracking animals here is you don't listen to the sounds of the forest. You don't listen to all of that. You actually look at the footprints on the ground and you start, right. you start your day from tracking your footprints. Uh, and when I got to India, it was a whole different, you know, take on, on tracking. And uh, the way they track there is listening to the sounds of the forest, which is, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a beautiful way to start your day. Like, yeah. It's, it's very, it's, um, it's something else. I feel like I everybody in Los Angeles is all about like meditating and finding presence and oh, trying to yeah. like, uh, like get away from the distraction of the world. I feel like if you're sitting there and your job is to sit there and listen for the, the animals in the forest. There's no better way to be present to the moment, you know? It's, it's honestly, it's one of the things I miss the most, not being in, in that forest is, you know, the alarm calls and, and just the regular sounds of that forest. It's unreal. So I'm, I'm really excited about getting back. Is there any part of you that it must be kind of an odd juxtaposition where you really want to film this animal and tigers, et cetera. But at the same time, they're very like quiet, large predatorial animals. Are you scared at all that it's going to come up behind you? And, uh, um, well, we, we based in vehicles all the time. So that changes the whole, the whole thing. So just being in the vehicle, vehicles are first step of, of safety. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, the only time I really have, um, a small issue with animals is is with the elephants and the elephants are I won't lie they um, they give me a little bit of an anxiety mm -hmm. issue there because they just love charging the vehicle so you know in Africa here yeah, depends also depends where you are so you you drive past a herd of elephants and they'll just casually walk past you in India you've got to be so careful about driving past certain elephants because they'll always just charge you and it's, <laughs> It's just like, <laughs> come on! I'm just trying to get past you. <laughs> yeah, they, please oh, yeah, leave me alone. Just come at you. Oh yeah, yeah. It's so. Um, 
it's it's not fun. It's it's very uncomfortable. But I, you know, I'm I'm noticed over a long period of time because we've got a vehicle that we work with that's very different to the rest of the vehicles that drive through the forest. Mm -hmm. And I have noticed seeing certain elephants getting more and more used to our vehicle and not they they from charging our vehicle to actually not charging. And it's also the way we approach, you know, especially when we go past them, um, you know, trying to casually drive past them and not, you know, just rush past like the, the regular person on safari there. That's interesting because you always assume, I don't know, I always pictured elephants as pretty docile, gentle creatures. Um, is that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not not those ones in that forest. In in. Do you think it's a complete like disposition change from an African elephant to an Asian elephant, or is it that the African elephants have more time to see you? They're more used to cars going around, or do you think it's just a general no, no, no personality the, difference? The the reason in India is there's human wildlife conflict is huge over there. So these elephants say they in Africa everything's fenced, pretty much fenced off. So. Um, you know, these ele elephants, you know, they're used to what they see within the fences. Mm -hmm. See, in India, they, they've got to deal with, you know, these huge vast tracts of forest where they're trying to get from A to B. And and half the time, it's dealing with trucks and, you know, people hooting at them and shouting, chasing them out of crops. And it's always, you know, it's, it's completely down to human wildlife con conflict. Oh, uh, okay. So that's, that's made these elephants aggressive you know you know the way they are yeah it's like a learned so, behavior that's that's yeah, too bad yeah it's yeah it's 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 a sad reality of that but um yeah is that something that they're working on kind of solutions to try and limit some of those interactions well they, i know i know it's, i know a lot of the national parks because there's a, a lot of them have got like main roads is thoroughfare right through mm -hmm. so you'll have a tar road right through the middle like a highway right through the middle of the national park and i know they are closing the roads off at night so there is no um contact with vehicles and animals at night uh, especially you know you get a lot of road kills and things like that that always happen uh, yeah. at night and yeah um, yeah, so I think you know that is a that is a start. Um, I, I don't know how long that's been implemented for, but I'm sure it's been around for for some time. I, I think, um, but yeah, yeah, they. I don't know. It's um, you know you you're looking at a country where there's a couple billion people living in, and and uh, the human encroachment into the national parks is is happening. Uh, sadly, I think you know the future of 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 India's jungles and forests and, and wild habitats will probably end up, you know, being what they've done here in, in Africa is fence it all off. I think that's a sad reality of it. Is that something that you take with you in your job? Is there, a, it must be almost kind of a sad reality that you might be documenting something as it used to be when we know that in the near future, it just might look completely different than what you're able to capture now. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I feel that especially like you know like places like Madagascar. When I go back to, I, I notice the difference. Like every year I go back, I notice the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think India has has a complete different outlook on 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 their wildlife opposed to you know what I've seen in in Africa, and um, I find it more spiritual and more humbling when they look at animals they um you see africa is just you know right up to right up to here with poaching right you can't you can't get rid of it it's 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 so bad so the one thing i've i've i've, I've noticed in in india is is poaching where i've been is is non-existent and if there is poaching it will be for honey or you know for or fish in the water, no, mm -hmm. not, nothing, you know, nothing that they're going to, you know, none of the elephants ivory being poached, uh, you know, n not the, not the stuff you're getting out here. So yeah, I think in Africa it's more for greed. And I think in India they have an appreciation for their wildlife. I, mm -hmm. I just feel like, I think the general um, person out here just, you know, there's people all over the world that appreciate wildlife, but in, in Africa, I think the local community communities just, um, money, money talks. 
Yeah, it's interesting because <clears throat> I always assume that a lot of the problems in Africa are due to kind of the socioeconomical parts of the people yeah. who are put like their backs are against the wall and it's trying to provide for their family, et cetera. But you would think Completely. India would be kind of a similar scenario where there's obviously 2 billion people, a good chunk of that population is also living um, with their backs against the wall as well. So it's interesting to hear that they have that perspective. Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's it's blown my mind away. Definitely, definitely something special that they've got going there. And so you'll see Asian elephants with big tusks walking around. And oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, huge, huge tusks. Because that's hard to find in Africa now, right? Like the the big tuskers. You you see them every now and then. Um, you know where where not all of Asia has these big tuskers. Um, it's more so where where we based. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's just an area known for big tuskers. And, so they are there. And so when you're in India, you've got this story that you want to tell about this new black leopard. How do you even begin to construct a narrative around something that you don't even know <laughs> what footage you're going to get and you don't know what's going to come of it? I guess we could even take where, it a step back too, where like, how did you find out about this and what inspired you to say, okay, like th- I want to tell a story about this. And then what story do you tell if you don't know the footage you're going to get, you know? Well, you know, going back a step was firstly, it's never been filmed professionally out in the wild before. It's never been properly documented. And um, that already is just going to get people jumping on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and um so we, 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 it, this whole film's with National Geographic. Um, it's going to be a big Cat Week feature uh, uh, next, next year, end of 2019. So it's um, a lot of times when you're filming these natural history films, you go there with an idea on what you want to shoot and behavior you want to capture. But 99% of the time, you don't get that. So you kind of let the animal at the time build a story for you and, and mm-hmm. everything around it. So they kind of write their own scripts. <laughs> right, you, right, you, right. You go, you go there with an idea and it's, 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 it's always different. So I'd imagine if it's such a unique experience that everybody was kind of jumping at the bit to be able to tell that story, how were you able to lock well, it down? We, I think we got there quite a few months before everyone else. Yeah. It, yeah, it was only after we were like halfway through the shoot. Um, these stories, everyone was yeah, like they're like getting bombarded with pictures and and stories on the on this cat. So we we got there quickly. We we made sure of that. Do you have a sense of what the story is going to be around it? Are you able to share that? Um, right now, uh, not yet. Uh, I. We've got like a basic wrap cut down, but we still, because we've got so much filming that to do, I'm not really sure which way it's going to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, could, it could, it it could go anyway. But pretty much of it's 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 life around the forest, and um, there's a whole lot of other characters, and there's tigers, there's regular leopards. Um, it's just a, it's just a, at the end of the day, it's just like a beautiful story that will kind of feel jungle bookish. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. With no humans. <laughs> that's awesome yeah and when you're out in that wilderness is it pretty frequent that you'll come across the other animals like tigers leopards obviously monkeys and birds you'll see a ton but how frequently are you seeing those kind of alpha predators uh on a good day we see a, a big cat every day oh really yeah yeah wow. so, so our goal our goal is to to at least document one big cat every day uh, just because it's such a dense forest. Uh, dry season, we'll see tigers multiple times in one day. Um, the wet season becomes very, very difficult. The monsoon season, um, you do see them, but you know, less frequently. But yeah, yeah, the dry season, you tend to see the tigers more and more often. Um, yeah, it's, it's all <laughs> being in the right place at the right time. So is the tiger population relatively healthy considering? in that area very very health very healthy tiger population there oh that's awesome yeah it's it's amazing it's, the tiger population is unreal and do you notice a difference between leopards in asia versus leopards in africa behavior wise are they pretty uh, similar animals 
Oh no, they they very very similar. It's it's the one thing I noticed in in Asia is um, well the biggest leopard I've ever seen, and I've seen some very big leopards in Africa. Is one of the leopards we're actually filming in the show. Um, he's hands down the biggest leopard I've ever seen, and incredible. I just he's just doesn't give like he doesn't worry at all about the vehicle being close <laughs> in his proxy. He right. would literally like come and mark this territory on the vehicle side of the vehicle <laughs> and just like look, stare at you and you're staring at a leopard like you're know, a meter away from you and um he doesn't care at all. He's he's amazing. Um I just never thought I I would see leopards because I you know leopards um out here and everywhere have been um depends where you are, but uh leopards have always been, you know, more on the skittish side, but there are pl- places where leopards just uh, just they, they think they own the place and um, <laughs> yeah this this leopard this particular leopard in india he's he's that leopard he thinks he owns the place which is quite amazing <laughs> <laughs> yeah there, there's it's it's quite amazing because there's a temple and this old old temple in the in the middle of the forest and that's like his throne like you often <laughs> you would find him you would often find him sitting on it Oh, so that's awesome. Cool. I mean, that's yeah, cinematic, yeah, like, right? <laughs> this perfect little like temple, old, you know, ancient old uh, temple out in the middle of the forest and there he is. That's something you would yeah, see so, in like the animated Jungle Book and be like, there's no way in yeah, hell that's yeah. realistic <laughs> at all. But yeah. that's yeah, cool. Really cool though. Really cool. Any other kind of hidden characters that like an, an animal in India in the film that you just didn't expect to fall in love with in the way that you have or that is just less commonly known? Um, all our leopard species, uh, I mean, all, all our leopard characters, not species, all our, our leopard characters, um, every individual one has, has got such an amazing behavioral traits that we've picked up on, which is really cool. Um, there's, uh, there's a couple of females that are just absolutely exquisite. The one animal that I did absolutely just, I'm besotted with is the Indian, the Asiatic wild dogs, uh, the Indian wild dogs, uh, or they're better known as dolls. Like D U L S D H D H O L E S. Okay. Dolls. 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 Never yeah. heard that before. Those are hands down some of the coolest animals I've ever come across. They are just a badass. Like I've seen them <laughs> chasing elephants around just, because they want to and right. um, ch- chasing leopards up the tree just because they want to like they they don't care that's like, super cool they yeah i personally think they actually own the forest <laughs> <laughs> they, they yeah they don't care about any other animal in it what do they look like really and they kind of like a, a i'd say the closest thing i'd say that they would look like would be the ethiopian wolf mm-hmm. i'd say an ethiopian wolf um they they vocalize and they and then their behavior is identical to um our African wild dogs, our painted wolves over here. Okay. So they they behave just like them in every way, but they're half the size, which is and they've but they've got some serious attitude. <laughs> cool. Yeah. That's really awesome. cool animals. I think I might have seen on your Instagram. Is are they the ones that like climb trees too? Like I thought I yeah, saw. Yeah, like, I, I, it's crazy. I've seen them climbing trees, which I, I I've only ever saw photos of them doing that. And then um, I, I I got told to you know stop filming so much of them, and I just can't help it because <laughs> they're just they're, they're just so entertaining. They're like we're here um, for the black the black yeah, jaguar. We're yeah. not here or black leopard. We're not here for these <laughs> these dogs that are everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So and and. They they're not always there, but when they're there, it's 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 amazing. So I've got all the time in the world for them. Can you see man's best friend dog in them? Can you get a sense like they're much more approachable than other wild species or not? Um, you can see where 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 man's love for dogs came from. Mm-hmm. Is what yeah is, is them. Yeah, they they really they're not shy at all, um, which is really cool. Have they been domesticated at all in India? No, wild dogs have been very difficult in general um, to domesticate. I think it's just because it, it, it has such a packed structure. It's been very, very difficult. Um, I've 
never heard of any cases of people with wild dogs, you know, African wild dogs or Asiatic wild dogs as as pets at home. Oh, interesting. I think it's I think it's almost virtually impossible. Oh wow! So they're yeah. so most they're completely dog, pack based. Yeah, it's like different than a wolf. So it's almost like yeah, you, know, you hear dog and you just think it would probably be easier to domesticate, whereas really most of no. the human pet dogs have come from wolves, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they're ex- insanely difficult. Um, so I've never heard of, um, you know, I know of habituation where they, you know, will walk right around you, but it's not going to come sit on your lap and ask for a scratch. I've seen, th- speaking of which, that I watched, what was it? Oh, it was Planet Earth 2 with these guys that have, that not domesticated, but they become so habituated to the hyenas in like yes, African yes. villages. There was this guy who was just feeding like lumps of meat from a butcher shop to this massive hyena that was like twice the size of him. I was like, what is this guy doing? He's going to get his hand bit off. I, I know hyenas are easier to, um, you know, hand raise and, and, and you know, you know I've, I've seen it in places where, where they you know, behave like that around people. But I know those ones up in Ethiopia are just completely reeled in on food. Mm-hmm. But they've um yeah, they they know they they're not they're not they're, they're not dumb they, they're incredibly smart animals so they they'll know if, if you know i'm i'm nice to this guy he's gonna give me a piece of meat and right uh, yeah i feel bad for hyenas i think the lion king kind of gave him a bad rap and now <laughs> nobody yeah. really likes them no that's that's true um they they incredibly um amazing animals those yeah, but the Lion King definitely gave it a bad rep. Yeah, I've seen. There's a new, there's a new, there's a new Lion King coming out now soon. Um, so hopefully hyenas are on a bit of a different light than that. I hope so, but I'm I'm not optimistic about it. <laughs> <laughs> are leopards typically? Are they? Um, they're not pack based, right? Do they have families, or are they kind of solo? They're, they're completely solitary animals. Okay, so I was wondering if they yeah. interacted like the the black leopard interacted any differently than other leopards, but Typically, they're just away from each other in general. Well, the one thing we've noticed with him is he's uh, courted n- multiple females at the same time, which we've never seen in in leopard behavior. It has been in, in you know with two females, but he's been seen with three females. <laughs> oh, so, so he's kind of a player. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He's um, he's got the whole forest reeled in there. <laughs> with this being the only known black leopard in the forest. Do you expect the the offspring to be black as well? Uh, his offspring won't be black unless he has mated with a female that has that recessive gene. So you can have that recessive gene. You could have your you could be a spotted cat, but uh, you you mate with another leopard with a recessive gene, and it could also be a spotted cat. And there you will have a, a I think it's like a twenty five percent chance of having a black cub. So if he mates with his daughter that he's had, which happens all the time with big cats and, and nature, it's, it's, it's the way it works. Um, there is a very good chance that that young cub will have a black cub. So they, in the, in the, in from years, you know, a couple of years from now, I think, I think the forest will see some black cubs running around. It's very, is, very possible. Is that common because just the way wildlife exists in the world today that um, just populations are a lot smaller. Is that something that for all of time would have that, that kind of inbreeding was normal? Um, No, no, that, uh, that happens. It's, it's, uh, it's all big, especially big cats. They hold territories and whoever grows up and passes through their territories will be a part of the, the bigger picture. Um, uh yeah it's it's i think i think uh, after you know many years of of the same thing it's just i don't know it's hard to explain it they, there's no bottleneck out in the wild so so it sounds like inbreeding but it's it's not it's um that it happens oh really um, ha- yeah yeah it happens all the time it's part of it's the part of the way they work it just doesn't have the same kind of negative effects it, that you would have it, in- no not at all. There, there will be, there will be no. You look at a lion pride. You, you look at a male lion. He has a pride for, let's say, 
six, seven, eight years. But in that pride, he's, you know, let's say there's three females that he starts off with. They have cubs. Those cubs grow up. The males will get kicked out of the pride. The females will stay. So then he will be mating with his daughters. And then those daughters grow up. They have cubs. Then he'll be mating with his granddaughters and, and so on and so on over the years. <laughs> right. And it, that's the way it works until you know he dies of old age or gets kicked out by some younger males and uh, the circle of life of the big cats goes on. Yeah, I think that's a, a good example of oftentimes people try and humanize animals to relate to them. I think that's just one that you kind of want to just, yeah, <laughs> just I think separate lions are, from. Yeah, I think, I think lions are the best way to 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 talk about it it's you know it's it's the young males that get kicked out the females stay in the pride they never get kicked out so you know that whole that that, that happens on uh, it, it's when the males get kicked it's out always been. do you find just male lions that wander by themselves alone or is it they usually pass pretty quickly after that uh, sometimes they'll be wandering by their own, but a lot of times um, they'll 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 be kicked out with a couple other young males all at the same time, and um, they tend to form little coalitions, and uh, within those coalitions, that's how they, you know, they survive, they hunt, they and eventually they take over prides on their own, and and sometimes they take over multiple prides. So you'll have a, some males that have you know three or four different prides. It's it's. It's confusing. Big cats are confusing. Oh, so it's like a, a coalition of males? Yeah, yeah. It always like be a, a coalition like of males. Like a divorced dad club or something like that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's yeah. really interesting. I had no idea. Yeah, they're pretty, they're pretty cool. Um, yeah, like our, our next film actually is, uh, you're going you're gonna to laugh at this. Oh, we've, we've got another film with, with National Geographic on, on Lions coming up. Yeah. Uh, um, we we start filming it soon, um, but it will be coming out in 2020, I think. Oh if wow! I remember correctly, so a long time. But it's on, it's on white lines. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. So we're doing a film on the black leopard, and now uh, we're doing a film on white lines. And the crazy thing is, like, the white line we're following. So you think a black leopard's rare, a white lion in the wild is even rarer. And where they exist is where I grew up in South Africa. And last year, the last two females were killed. So there's there's one by, by marauding males that have come in to try and take over prides. But the thing is, in the wild, they never live long because of their genetic difference. Mm-hmm. And um, there's one one. Male lion. Oh my god! In the wild. So we're actually going to be following him for a while. Wait. So not uh, not even in that one park, like anywhere. It's yeah, in the wild, anywhere. That's crazy. All of Africa. There's only one. So he's he's going to be the the star of our our next next show. Wow, that's but super cool. He's, yeah, he's 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 very difficult. So he's difficult. Why? So, how so? I think I think it's going to be very difficult because because it's in the Kruger National Park and it's he's at that stage of his life is where he's going to be kicked out of his pride very soon mm. to to go live off on his own. So we need to get in there and get as much content before before he gets kicked out because the pride is quite an amazing. There's over you know there's over thirty lines if I remember correctly in the pride. So it's like a oh, super yeah. I always pride thought prides yeah. were like twelve or fifteen or something. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's like that's a big pride. This is like a super pride. Oh damn. So, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a crazy, crazy story. And um there have been a few white lions that have been born in that pride, but they've never lived to adulthood and now he's he's about four years of age now. So um Wait, he's it's gonna he's be, only four years old? Yeah, yeah. And he's he, getting- this is the age that's when they get roughly around when they get kicked out and then they head off on their own. Oh, so, so do they get kicked out as basically like they've reached past adolescence and they need to go do their own it's, thing? Is that it's, kind of it's, it like, it's like when you turn 18 and, you're, and your parents tell you to piss off and go find a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I thought it was the opposite. I thought it was like he was reaching into like his elderly years and lions no, have no respect no, no. for their elders and they're like, get the hell out of here. No, 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 no. He he's he has to go find a job. <laughs> is the entire survival of that kind of sub 
segment of lions based on him and his survival, like his ability to produce offspring? No, no, the the gene the genes are within the area. So there there's a lot of white lion cubs that pop out every now and then. But there's never been, as far as I know, there's never been a male white lion that's lived to that age. They have lived to that age in captivity, but not in the wild. So with him being a wild male that's lived to that age, they usually get killed off at about six months of age before they even get six months uh, old. So yeah, he's yeah, he's a couple years away from his prime. And uh, it's the fact that he's lived so long is 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 a rare feat already. But um, and amazing story. So hopefully we get to spend a lot of time with him. Yeah, that's super cool. Do they have yeah. any sense as to why that gene might have been developed? Because I know, like, similarly, recessive gene is the the spirit bears in British Columbia, where mm. the black bears all of a sudden become they almost look albino, but they're like blonde. Mm. But I know. I think scientists hypothesize that they became blonde because it helps them not have as much of a shadow when they're going to hunt salmon. Um, that there might be some reason as to why they were test the evolution was testing out this color or something. Is there anything <laughs> similar of that as the lions? Like, is there any benefit to being a white lion? Uh, not that I know of because lions do a lot of hunting at night and those white lions stick out like a sore thumb. Um, <laughs> yeah. They, when they're dirty, I think they, they, they can get away with a fair amount of, um, you know, camouflaging in, but, you know, it, a regular tawny line is at its, you know, best being the color that they are because they just, you know, they just blend in with, with things so easily. Do you think it's um, like the, the black leopard in India that the, the white lion gets all the chicks because <laughs> he's just different and they're like him? <laughs> I I don't I don't know. I will find out when, you know, if if he does live to his um maturity and actually ends up taking over prides. Uh we'll we'll see all about that. Yeah, that'll be interesting. It will be very interesting. Um but uh, unfortunately uh we won't be filming at the time. We we never know, we might still be following him if if everything works out. Um but yeah. That must be nice for you. I remember when we were talking, you were mentioning that you really haven't had a home per se for three years or so you're on the road with your wife is yeah is, so you'll be kind of back home when you're shooting this right i'm i'm gonna be in india for for some time uh i've got i've got some other projects in scandinavia and um but um, my younger brother is actually gonna start this project oh before cool i started yeah yeah and then um my wife shan shan will uh, also start on the project um she's coming up to india just for a short a short period of time but uh uh she's going to be based back here and uh, overseeing the project from this side whilst i'm away so so i will probably only get to start on this project july next year even though um, i think we start filming in the next week or so I think what's so unique about your relationship with your wife is the fact that she's also in wildlife filmmaking as yeah. well. Can you talk about what it's like to be working with your wife in that capacity and what your relationship looks like? Like how often are you together? Are you usually filming together or do you go long periods without doing so? I just uh, think it's such a unique story. We 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 with each other all the time. So we we get to which is we're very fortunate about that. Uh, a lot of traveling, a lot of filming. I, I think it works out pretty well because um, Shan, like in India, Shan will be in one vehicle, and I'll be in another vehicle, or we'll both be in. It just uh, depends on on the work we're doing. Um, a lot of the technical stuff we actually do need two people, um, so that helps out quite a lot um, with um, mm-hmm. the new, especially you know the, the you know. With some, we we're utilizing some pretty awesome technology in in the filming that we've been doing. So you do it's it's kind of like a two man band to to get the shots we're after. Um, yeah, because it's all on then, red cameras, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're yeah high resolution, amazing you know, image quality. But then we're also using some amazing gimbal tracking systems and aerial you know aerial work where we actually need two people. 
mm-hmm. focusing on 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 different things at the same time. And the same goes to you know when when we start working on this project here in South Africa is is we will need to uh, capture as much as possible in in our time frame that we've got to do the project. But then we will be we'll be using multiple cameras um, to, in order to do this. So so brings us together again. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and, and I, I know she's excited about it because it's going to be closer to home. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also ex- I'm also excited about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, also she's taking a bit of a break off uh, from from because it's 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 been yeah, getting pretty hectic with all this uh, traveling. Oh, I can and imagine. She, yeah, and she's um, she's injured her, her her spinal cord, so she's in. Full recovery mode. Oh wow! Um, was she working at the time? Yeah, yeah. I was in India on on uh, going from one place to another uh, for a tiger sighting. <laughs> Bad bump on the road. Oh damn! Yeah, so so she's um, she's got um, many months of physio and all of that to to get through and sort her back out. Do you That's, see? your life going in a similar direction as it has, or do you think you guys will eventually slow down? Like, what do you think? Like, do you like living on the road as much as you are? Or do you think it's sustainable? I, I don't mind. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I don't mind at all. I, I, I don't think it'll slow down on my side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Do you ever yeah. feel a, a little bit of a sense of stress? Like I remember one of the first things I ever saw of your wife was the Komodo dragon filming, which is like phenomenally stunning. But I saw this behind the scenes photo of her with, it was her and then the camera. And then like literally right next to the camera was this massive, probably 12 foot long Komodo dragon. Are you ever just pulled out of like what you're doing for work and like, Oh my God, I need to get my wife out of this situation or you- mm, no, when it comes to things like that, I'm fine. Uh, there was, there was one, one incident where we were working with some habituated cheetah and the cheetah attacked her. Oh really? And more and more though. And I actually, I filmed the whole thing. I didn't know it was going to happen. I just, I just had the camera rolling and uh, there was a bunch of people trying to pull this cheetah that had grabbed on the arm here and pinned her down to the ground. Oh my god! And yeah, that was that was the one time where I kind of just dropped the camera and I walked up to the cheetah and I poked it in the eye and I let it go. <laughs> well, that, I'm glad you told the second half of the story because when you started, you were like, "I filmed it." I was like, "Well, when did you stop filming?" <laughs> oh, was that a horrible yeah, she, thing, or she got away pretty unscathed? That seems traumatizing. I know she got a, she got quite a few stitches. Damn. Oh, she, yeah, her war wounds. They're usually pretty uh, skittish, right? Cheetahs comparatively to yeah, yeah. But they they had a human imprint on them. So you know, it's when 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 these big animals, these big cats, have got human imprints on them, things are completely different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, she she got down and the uh, cheetah just grabbed her, just came out of nowhere and just took her out. <laughs> Jeez, that's awful. So, yes. Yeah, she, yeah, she's got some nice scars to to represent it. I always thought that would be cool. I definitely don't actually <laughs> believe this, but I always thought when I was a kid growing up that I would never want to get attacked by a shark or mauled by a cheetah or something. But there's something about having like a small scar that if people asked and you're like, <laughs> yeah, a, a, a great white like nicked my arm or something, there's something kind of badass about that. As long as it oh, doesn't yeah. go like drastically wrong, obviously. I don't want to be in that situation, but... Street cred. No, I, I don't guess. think anyone. I don't. Yeah, I think it's good street cred, but I don't think anyone ever wants to be in those situations. No, um, no, no, not ever. And so was she in Madagascar with you? You just got back, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We all there. We all there together. Uh, what were you working on there? Uh, we had a group of people that came and joined us, and then I, I just did a bit of filming, some recce filming for for something that I've been trying to work on for some time. Wait, recce film? Yeah. Oh, so kind of just like not related yeah. to a project. Yeah, not not related. I was just getting some stock footage uh, for something. It's, it's something I've been trying to put together for a while. I know you had mentioned that Madagascar was a little sad when you notice every time you're going that it's getting further and further deforested. Um, 
what it's bad. Like, yeah, it's that bad. Like like how like what percentage? It, just to kind of put it into perspective, is it because it's it's the biggest island in the world, right? I mean, yeah, outside of like well, Australia Aust- or something Australia, like that. Yeah. Um. Uh, here's an idea. Uh, so Madagascar loses ten percent of its forests every year. Wow. That's a lot. That's a huge amount. Yeah, ten percent of its forests every year. And is it concentrated in one area, or they the forest started to get really fragmented? Uh, they they're getting more fragmented now, but um, it's all for the charcoal burning and wood burning and all of that. And then there's also before it used to be a lot for for the legal uh, wood trade in certain woods. I think if I remember correctly, it was rosewood and there was some other wood. Um, there was there was a lot of illegal logging within, you know, just for that. Uh, but I know the forest. I've noticed, you know, certain parts of the forest that I've I've been going to for four years now. I've noticed that on the drive to those forests, I'm noticing patches, and those patches are getting bigger and bigger mm-hmm. where they've cut down. Yeah, so you, I'm seeing it every time. It's horrible it's too because it's not like you're talking yeah. like a crazy. Like it'd be one thing if you're like. 25 years ago it used to be like this but mm. four years is not a long period of time when considering no, no not at all no it's, it's really sad does the government seem to be stepping in at all is there investment going in don't get, no they don't care yeah it's all you know and in, in with all the, the big forests it's all government owned places i think if the only way you're going to sort of you know save the forests in Madagascar is if it gets privatized and people buy up the land. Mm -hmm. When we look, we talk about India and the human wildlife conflict, Madagascar. Do you, where do you feel like your role comes in in conservation? Is there something that do you take an active role in what's going on? Or is, is there a philosophy that you think has the ability to actually make an impact on a big wide scale or is it kind of, I, I hope I always hope the films that we work on, um, do that uh, for sure. It's it's all it's always that's always um, the big goal with with the films that we do and and get these places more recognized than what they really are. Um, you know, at the moment, I can hands down say the Black Leopard we're filming in India. I would say he's the most famous, well known cat in the entire world. Everyone knows about him now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just 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 through social media, his photos are just popping up everywhere, and uh, he's draw he's he's. Thousands of people have just come just to see him, and you know, thousands, thousands of people have left without seeing him. And but uh, you know, when when you do, it's a viral photograph straight away. <laughs> it's it just shows you like um, you know what one cat can do. Yeah, um, and it's bringing a lot of um, attention to that particular national park. We got him there, I think, at the right time with the film, and hopefully. Hopefully the film also, you know, does does that national park justice as well. I mean, it's such a beautiful part of the world. But then, you know, working out there, I, I honestly, I, I wish I could do more. If I had access to to funds, I think I'd I would just be buying land and just let nature just take over as much as possible. Yeah, that that's the way I I do it. Have you ever heard of um, Half Earth? It's this this new movement. E.O. Wilson is this. Um, I just heard about it, so I honestly haven't researched it very much. But one of our earlier podcasts, they were talking about it. But he's this big conservationist biologist, and his idea is trying to rally support around setting aside half of the Earth for strictly wildlife purposes. It seems really yeah. ambitious, but to me, I look at something like that, and I. I think conservation is so important on a grassroots level, but you almost have to think of it systematically on like a global scale to see what will truly make yeah. an impact across the world. Yeah. I don't know. There are people there that are, are buying, you know, vast tra- tracts of land out there and, and taking over government based na- national parks and, and completely, you know, almost privatizing it mm-hmm. and, and watching those models be so successful. That's what you need. And, and, and the thing is like, Madagascar is one of those places that needed it ten years ago. Yeah, they, it's going downhill so quickly. It needed it twenty years ago. It, it really is going downhill so quickly. And um, I think, I think if if I could ever ever invest in some you know proper land and and vast tracts of land, it would be it would be there. And um, just securing some forests because what I, what I've gathered it seems like 
as soon as something's privatized, the locals won't go cut down the wood. They think because it's government, they can go do whatever they want. Oh, uh, okay, that makes sense. So that I think that's I think that's the mentality there. I, I, I don't know. And the wildlife is spectacular over there. I mean, oh, it's mind blowing. It it really is mind blowing. It's it's amazing that um, there's still so much wildlife. But you can imagine what it used to be like. Yeah, that that's the yeah. dream, right? I always like wish I could live like Mowgli in the Jungle Book for. Yeah. <laughs> a yeah. year or so well the w- one thing you've got to look at madagascar is it it as when it was an island there was no inhabitants on it mm-hmm. people came to madagascar over time it was it was never inhabited so you look at the animals there and they've got pretty much you know the, that genetic imprint that they've just had no fear of anything oh uh, so yeah you'll be walking walking through the forest and 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 they're just so curious they just come right up to you which is amazing it's like like Mad- uh, Galapagos, Madagascar's like Galapagos. yeah, you're like in Snow White. Like I always remember watching Snow White when I was a kid, and I was like, I want to go in the forest and have the birds land on my shoulder and the yeah, the yeah. squirrels come up. I mean, that's it's a. I'm about to finish by Thanksgiving my film on the overpopulation of feral cats in Hawaii. And it's a very similar yeah thing where I think it's hard to really fully understand how these animals have no defense mechanisms when they were evolved on these isolated islands for millions of years i mean you can go up into the mountaintops of Kauai, find one of these burrows where these critically endangered seabirds live and literally reach in and pick them up and like just like walk around and place them in like a lot of scientists do that because they do research on them but it's amazing what an island's like yeah but unbelievable i mean the lemurs and are lemurs found anywhere else in the world besides madagascar no just just there. it's 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 Biodiversity is like I think it's like ninety nine percent unique just to Madagascar. Those are crazy animals. It's nuts. It it really is nuts. Yeah, there's that photo you posted. Was it last week where you're you you have your red camera and I think there's one on you and one on the camera just like hanging out. <laughs> I was like, that's the dream. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up something. I want to show you something yeah. from Madagascar that went extinct. They reckon as close as I could be wrong. It's 300 to 500 years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah I'm, you I'm excited, yeah. What? Is that an egg? Is that an egg? Yeah. What? This, this is an elephant bird egg. What? Wait, is it real? Yeah, this is like this fossilized. Is, this is, yeah, this is all the shells being put together on it. How did you find that? Or <laughs> like, how, uh, who gave that? To- we, we got it in, in one of these um, little uh, street markets in Madagascar, and I saw it, and I was like, "That's coming home with me." What came out of that? Uh, <laughs> like the largest, so it's like an ostrich-sized bird. It, it, yeah, it was the largest bird that that uh, well, one of the largest birds, um, and. Um, yeah, completely, you know, lived out on Madagascar. And uh, they, yeah, they reckon some say the last 300 years it went extinct, but some say a lot further. And these are just remnants of the shells and then just pieced together. Did it fly? No, flightless. It was just like a big ass ostrich. Oh my God. A really, yeah. Dude, that's the type of thing you find there. And not that you would, but like you could get that at a street market and then go to some like, hoity-toity oh, yeah. event in LA yeah. and sell it for like hundred grand or something. Oh yeah. You must see the stuff that you find in the, in the street markets. They're like fossils. It's so rich in, 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 in history, that Island fossils and all kinds of stuff. Amazing. Really. Amazing. I can't wait to Google what that thing looked like. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But this is, this is, this is one of those animals that went extinct when people arrived on the Island. Yeah. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because you know, it was a big chicken, I could hunt it very easily and, and eat it very. Yeah, easily. and there's a lot of meat. I'd imagine it's kind of. Like, I yeah, heard. Yeah. I read a book where when humans first reached Australia, there were like seven species or some large number of species of giant marsupials. Yeah, literally like dinosaur-sized kangaroos and things of that nature. But those animals were things that were just so easy to take down and feed an entire village for a long period of time that. 
none of them lasted more than like a hundred years from when humans got there. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know Madagascar had a giant lima species and if I remember correctly, they had a hippo, like a pygmy hippo or some kind of hippo that lived out there. A lot of stuff went extinct, you know, and, and especially being so isolated from the, you know, the rest of the world, um, you know, in recent years more, you know, you know, within the last 500,000 years, something like that. Crazy. Did you have a children's Fun show thing. in Africa uh, um, with the lemur being like the main character is like a stuffed lemur, Sesame Street style? I forget the name of it, but it was like a very, no. <laughs> it was a very big car. Um, like it was like the wildlife show you watch when you're a kid at seven in the morning on Saturday. Uh, yeah. um, it had no, some like no. crazy name, like Caduzel or something like that. I'll have to look it up. I'll link <laughs> it in the show notes, but just super interesting. Um, but on, on the kind of conservation side, I think what you're saying is so true in the fact that I think conservation generally takes one of two stances when it comes from the media side of things, which is either show this like massive, beautiful animal like a black panther to kind of create that wonder and that awe, or there's that doom and gloom side of like, look at this whale that's choking up plastic. Yeah. And I really don't think that that doom and gloom messaging is powerful unless you have the other one. Like you need to get people to the care be- in the, the first place yeah. about the beauty of nature yeah. is, yeah. is what, what will get, get people any day, but people do need to see the, uh, the harsh reality of what's really going on out there as well. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. I, I definitely think there's a place for it, but I think like your work yeah. where you look at like understanding how yeah. beautiful this is, gets people to care about the other side of the messaging more so and actually yeah. want to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely two way or two ways about it. There was another scenario that I wanted to talk a little bit about that I saw on your Instagram of your recent trip to Scandinavia, and there was this massive bear and a wolf in the same photo. I just wanted to uh, yeah. be, understand what you were doing there and how you found that situation because it looked amazing. Um. So. So this is a, a new series coming out with, with uh, National Geographic as well. So you can, you, you'll see I do a lot of work with them. Mm-hmm. There is a place in Finland and very interesting part of uh, Finland. So it's in this area called No Man's Land. Uh, it's a piece of, I think it, what, it, what it was or what it still is, is a demilitarized zone between Russia and Finland. And this piece of land is just a wildlife haven corridor. So there's no hunting. There's none of this. There's no one that lives in there. There's just animals. So along these places, some of these, um, you know, people that have, um, you know, enjoy the photography of the years have, you know, set up these hides and these hides are in areas where bears frequent to quite often. Mm-hmm. And one of the areas is, been very famous for quite some years now is a, a set of hides where there are a lot of bear and wolf activity together. So this is, so my producer that I, I was working with, he spent um, eight months out there doing a, another film on the bears and wolves there. So we did a, f- a few days. I wish we had months out there. Yeah, it looked and, crazy. Uh, it was crazy. Yeah, it was, it was incredible. So you're staying in this little wooden box with a bunch of material in front of you. <laughs> and, and, and like when, when I first got dropped off and you sleep there, so you're bringing like a blanket with you and a pillow and you sleep in this tiny little wooden box out in the middle of you know, <laughs> no, no way, like on the border, border of Russia. Oh my God. And, um, and uh, in, in, in the one side, it's just material. Like you could literally walk in and out of it. Oh, and, really? Uh, that's, yeah, it's like, so the material you know, covers your, your cameras so you can move, maneuver mm. your cameras. And then the other side is all, you know, doored up and so it's all wooden, it's all paneled up. But, oh man. And what was the I, trip like, out I'm, there like? Like, do you take a helicopter out there? No, no, no. We, we drive and then we walk out to these, these, these uh, hides. Um, but then you'll you'll take like these specialized quad bikes that have got like uh, almost like snowmobile tires on. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, this is a crazy part of the world. Yeah, that sounds and, amazing. Uh, you, you you spend the nights out there, and um, often often you get this bear wolf activity, which is which is pretty impressive. Quite a remarkable 
um, behavior and you know this is behavior that's been going on for for quite so quite a few years now and that shot that you saw was the very first wolf I ever saw in the wild oh really yeah so I was sitting there in the hide and I had no idea like you know what was going to happen and like I got there and a bear came past and then eventually another bear came past and then in the distance I could um I saw this white thing moving through the forest and my like my heart just started beating so fast and, like I was <laughs> freak I was I, I was completely freaking out like I was like this is the craziest thing this wolf coming <laughs> I can and, imagine like, this wolf followed this one bear in and like it was like starting to nip at him and it was it was crazy crazy like, stuff just for fun it was kind of yeah it was just like you know a dog having fun like chasing the bear around for fun and, and and those wolves seem to to do it quite frequently. They they live you know off. I think the bears are their entertainment. So <laughs> they just have a, a wolf and bear moment all the time. It's crazy. I love that stuff because it just goes to show like anybody that thinks animals are just kind of dumb things, just living without like ah. without a date. Like they have days like fun, enjoyable times, just like we do. They have families, just like we do. Like to think that. You would never expect a wild animal just to go and like screw around with a bear for the hell of it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Those wolves. What I witnessed then the few few times I was out in those hides and seen those um, bears and wolves together. Um, it it seemed like the bull the the they they were bullied by the wolves. Like they. <laughs> they they the wolves just like thrived off entertaining, you know. You know, just you know, if they had an opportunity to chase a bear around, they would do it. Yeah, it was the one day. So I remember sitting there, and the wolves came in. There was no bears. Um, oh no, there was a bear that left, and then the wolves came in, and it was like they just disappeared again. And then I, in in the corner of my eye, like I was. I, no, I think I was using my telephoto lens or something like that. I saw some, and this field is massive, massive, massive. And in the far end, it was probably a couple of kilometers away, I saw four wolves following a bear. I was like, what <laughs> is going on? And then they follow this bear, and then eventually the bear like took a U-turn and then didn't come to where I was. And then these wolves came past me again, and they did this again. And then I saw them doing exactly <laughs> what I saw them following in the, and it looked like they were herding these bears like in this <laughs> open field like and then all of a sudden they, there was these two bears walking straight towards me and then there is these wolves following these bears behind them and I was like what this is crazy so I, I don't know I just had it's my theory on them I just think they you know they need some entertainment and the bears <laughs> it's them. something to do would they ever yeah. like hunt and kill a bear no 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 that, that bad one had but I mean, those are big yeah. bears. What are, they're grizzlies, right? Oh yeah. No, it's a Eurasian brown bear, which is actually bigger than the grizzly. Well, that's what I was wondering because there was another photo where there was one like it looked like it was on all fours, like yelling at you. I don't know what, it, but it was just. But to me, it looked black, like other than the other brown bear. It was so soaking wet. It was raining oh, that day, and it was like God. extremely dark at the time. Because I was like, if that's a so black it's, bear, it's like three times bigger than any other black bear I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it's it, no, they're big. Uh, I, I tell you, and it's you know, bears are. You know, my first introduction with bears was polar bears, and and then, and then after that was the in, the sloth bears in India, and then it was these Eurasian brown bears. So, I don't, um, I don't know bears well enough to, you know, know their their behavior, um, you know, well enough. And it's it's an animal that's still tiptoe around. Like it's like, yeah, I'm not gonna go walk around there because I know there's bears over there, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it it's it's one of those animals like. It's one of those animals that I need more time and experience with just to to understand it better. I mean, I think if if they, if we if we got them in Africa, it would have been a different story. Yeah, I mean, that's an animal that you look at, and I mean, it can mess you up if, if you do, if you interact with oh, it incorrectly. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I saw um, Paul Nicklin posted an Instagram story the other day where he was up in it was either Alaska or British Columbia, and 
he was sitting down. Like, I always look at these close up of bears and I'm like, oh, it's either like maybe there's some water in between or it's a hide or something. And like understanding how he gets so close, he was literally sitting on the ground and there was a bear like three feet from him, like almost touching the camera. And he looked as co- like cool as a cucumber. It was the same thing I thought when I saw your wife in front of a Komodo dragon. It, it, you guys, <laughs> I just think like in your profession, you must just really you in, get used to it. Yeah, must intimately understand yeah. specific species because anybody else in the world would be like running to like <laughs> running as <laughs> hard and fast as they possibly could. Yeah, it's um, it, you know the, one of the most important things in the in this you know field of work is is understanding animal behavior and um, it's. Uh, it's one of those things that you know anyone that wants to get in the industry. I I always say that you need to really, really understand that, um, um, you know, properly. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it, I, it, I I saw yeah. one of you petting a a hippo, and I was like, hippos are like <laughs> yeah, one yeah. of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous animal in Africa, right? Uh, yeah, that 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 was that was just down the road from where we are now. Um, that uh, in. I can't even tell you how long it was about eight years ago. We had some really big floods over here, so it was a uh, a baby hippo that washed up in uh, a friends of ours uh, down the road. It washed up in their in their dam, so they they raised this little hippo. So it was a hippo <laughs> that you could go and chill with. And like that was when it was fully grown by then. But crazy being so close to a big animal like that. Wait, so does he does he like the family? Yeah, he, he literally comes and wanders in and out the house and all of that. Um, Wait inside like, the house? He's, yeah, he's like a dog now. What? Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. That's horrible. No, no, it, it, it's crazy. Yeah. And is it's he crazy. only cool with your friends, or does anybody that walks around like he's like just? No, no, they they, they get quite a few people to go there, but go in there and go see the hippo. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, there's a, another hippo. You know probably about an hour and a half from here that's world renowned she's an absolute famous hippo uh, called Jessica the hippo and people all over the world go and see her she's been on television so often like, really it's crazy yeah 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 that's an animal i don't very, understand very... why it's not up there with the elephants and the big cats of the world i look at a hippo and i'm like it's one of the most majestically like it's... beautiful animals and people don't really like give it the it's due you know it's probably one of the most dangerous animals out there. That's hands down. Yeah, it's an ornery thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even though I was that close to them, I still, you know, I wasn't comfortable. You'd mentioned polar bears. Where were you doing that in Svalbard? Yeah, yeah. We got to Svalbard every year, so spent quite a fair amount of time with polar bears. Uh, never enough time. I'm I'm obsessed with that part of the world. So if I could, you know, go up there for months and months on end, I'll be very happy. I heard it's like one of the few places you can go and it feels like it's just an untouched wilderness of Oh, hands down. It's when you're out there, you're out there. It feels like, you know, if I get lost now, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> one of those. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that that's it. Like out there, because the, the you know the conditions and climate so harsh, something goes wrong, like it can go wrong very badly for you. Well, and very very badly. like we were talking about grizzlies and black bears and stuff. The only time, I mean, I'm sure there's there's outliers to everything, but most of the time, grizzly humans have bad interactions. It's because somebody spooked a, gr- a bedding grizzly or something like that. Whereas polar bears, yeah. they actively hunt humans, like. Like yeah. if oh, you're yeah. out, they, you you watch that animal look at you like it knows it knows you food. It, yeah, it wants you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like a crocodile. Like I think they're the only two things that actually look at pe- people or humans as as a food source. Not to keep jumping around because we just got to Svalbard, but you mentioned crocodiles, and I agree they look at humans like a food source. But I've seen photos of you in the water with them. And I look. I, that's another thing. I'm just like, what is going on in this guy's head? Can you walk us through like what the moments I, I, leading I, up I, to that moment were, and and what the situation was? So this is this was in uh, on an island just off the coast of Belize, and, and or, you know off off Mexico and on the border of Belize. And uh, apparently, the history behind this little island is these crocodiles have always been there, but so have the fishermen. And 
there's these little fishing huts that are out at sea and the crocodiles have lived amongst them. And you know, obviously the fishermen, you know, cut up their fish and throw their scraps in the water and the crocodiles have lived alongside these people for, I don't even know how long, but forever. And, um, yeah, people started diving with them, and it's it's one of those things that you know you always got to respect the the boundaries. But they come up to you, but they they're not interested in you. It's like they kind of look through you. They're only interested in like other things over there. And um, the first time I got in the water, I, I it took me a while to actually just say like like my head was go- like going going in at itself like i was like what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> why are you doing this like this animal but then i was like okay but it's not the Nile crocodile it's not the saltwater crocodile this is the the american crocodile and they are a lot more placid at the same time so there was a lot of like what the hell is going on why are you doing this and but once you're down there it was it was very very docile like the crocs you know you know it was so relaxed you know they just out there and then every now and then they'll go up to the surface uh, to to breathe and then they'll go back down and they're just laying on the bottom of the um and it is really shallow waters as well mm-hmm. but at the same time you don't see like we've got a whole group of people out there you know we've got people watching from above uh from a from a high, a high vantage point watching if there's other crocodiles that come off You've got, I've got a guy standing next to me the whole time, and then I've got a guy standing a few meters behind me, looking if any crocodiles mm. are coming from behind. Mm-hmm. So pretty much from above and right around me, I've got people blocking off other crocodiles potentially coming. And so it was very, it was very safely done, and it made me feel a lot safer at the same time. Um, yeah, so nothing's going to sneak I, up on you. Yeah, yeah, and you're not just going to go do that with crocodiles. I mean, these guys knew the individual crocodiles by you know different markings on their mm-hmm. face this one's missing a tooth here this one's you know blind in this eye and like <laughs> so so all of them knew and then and then the one day like we were under the water and then all of a sudden this new crocodile pulled in and started fighting with these these crocodiles and we're like we don't know who this crocodile is and and um but it 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 got it could have been really bad because they're fighting and eventually they they, they start fighting they came over me these these two big crocodiles came right over me, and I had to push them away with my underwater oh camera housing. Oh my god! And I was like, I was like, guys, get me out the water now! <laughs> like, I was like, I was like, I'm not gonna stay here. Like, <laughs> running out of lives right now. Feeling like feeling 300 pounds of dragon oh, on no. top of you must be a weird yeah. feeling. It it wasn't fun. I can promise you that. Well, I think like was, uh, you must have in your line of work the ability to get comfortable in those situations because i do yeah. believe that animals can kind of smell that on you like if you if you were if i were to get into that water with the crocodiles they probably wouldn't be so docile because i'd be so freaked out that they'd be like what's going on here so it must it, it must be a level of a skill that you've developed in being able to calm down in those types of scenarios i would imagine yeah um I, I think I think when I saw how calm the crocodiles were under the water when I first got in, mm-hmm. I was I was like, okay, this is going to be a lot easier than I thought. And it's going to be a lot easier for me as well because I it, it was a while like until I you know I got a hundred percent used to it and spent a few it was about four days doing you know these dives with these crocodiles and um, it was pretty pretty damn mind blowing, but. Um, it, it did take me it, it did take me a while to get used to it, but what really changed everything was was how relaxed the crocodiles were. You can see if an animal doesn't want you anywhere near it or anything like that, mm-hmm. and they were just completely just chilled out, zoned out in their in their little world. They didn't even bother about us. What they've been living for hundreds of years with fishermen giving them like solid fish. They probably like, yeah, they're yeah, like they're, if I don't have to work for this food, why would I do it? You know? Yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of that. That, that mentality you had mentioned you go to Svalbard every year you're going to spend a couple more weeks or months in India to most people it sounds like probably the coolest dream job in the entire world doing what you're able to do what was your journey like how did this come about was it something you've been doing your entire life or how have you been able to sustain living this like, I, I... incredible career 
I studied economics, so and, and that didn't get me into this industry. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, where 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 I um, where I where I grew up in this particular re- region of South Africa was um, it's you know very rich in conservation. There's a lot of you know we've got national parks around us. There's a lot of private reserves. It's, we and then the house I grew up in, we we always had orphaned animals and all kinds of stuff coming through the doors and and all of that. And um, yeah, particularly because of my parents. And uh, then my dad started a, a conservation related, you know, orientated company, uh, and works all over Africa with big national parks and big private reserves all over Africa. And I got to see a lot as that and, and meet a lot of people over the years and um, you know they have uh, some very old uh, old old wild wildlife filmmaker friends and mm-hmm. I always just said you know I I want to I want to I want to do what you guys do but you know since then they they retired and and I was just like okay this is this is also a difficult uh, industry because you don't really know where to start and um I uh, I bought myself a camera after I finished university and I made a short film on on rhino researches and rhino conservation and um, pretty much just history from there onwards. Yeah, I got into you know all the freelance work um, and then you know now I've got into writing up my own stories and 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 seeing where they end up going. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's at the same time being behind the camera. So yeah, it's. Um, like like I said, like people say, when there's a passion, you just got to follow it. And um, I think this is, is something I'll, I'll always be doing. I mean, it's not something you can go to school for, but it's it's something you can actually, anyone can do it if you just got time and go out and, you know, spend time with nature. And like I said, like understanding animal behavior mm-hmm. is probably one of the key things. And I, I was very fortunate enough at a young age to spend a lot of time with animals. Uh, a lot, so I think um, I think that helped a lot in into you know where I am with my camera work these days. But things have changed so much as well as is, is, is technology is right. working with some right. some of the state of the state of the art. Like years years ago when we started, you know, we were filming on tape, and then we moved to digital. And now, like you know, you know, to high massive resolutions like we, what we've got on these red cameras. Then you you look at Days when we were filming out of helicopters, now everything's done off drones. And mm-hmm. It's it's yeah, you, you got it's one thing you, you got to adapt and embrace technology as soon as it comes out. You yeah, gotta embrace it. Like a lot of guys fell short, um, you know, not embracing it and saying, "Oh no, I'm uh, you know, this is the way you know, I do it. This is the way I'm." And and those are the guys that are, are struggling the most now is they just never embraced. And when they did, it was a bit too late, like, you know, kind of got forgotten. Well, it makes sense. I mean, you look at, and I'm not saying this in like a brown nose fashion, but you look at your footage and it's just mind blowing. Like, I mean, granted, there's a lot of the creative aspect of it is is more than anything, but just the, the mm. resolution and the quality and like the contrast and the color spectrum, it's like, holy shit. Like you couldn't even imagine being able to go back to like anything else, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. To the point oh, yeah. where like you can I, even I, like probably pick. I think you mentioned this to me. Like you don't even necessarily need to do photography because you can pick a specific I, I, frame and just be like, okay, I, I want that. I haven't taken a photograph in years. Like it's, uh, I did a few in Madagascar because uh, I had the camera in my hand. But when 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 I when I've got these cameras and I'm filming, I've never had a reason to take a photograph. Yeah. Pull the frames out of the the video files. Have people been reaching out to you about doing any like virtual reality stuff? Uh, mm, I know Shan has been contacted about it. I've done some stuff uh, when I was working with Disney. Mm-hmm. We did a whole VR VR piece on Victoria Falls, but it's just it's just I don't know. It's just uh, I oh yeah, I have, uh, a guy contacted me recently about. Um, just locations for a virtual reality shoot, and I just suggest, suggested some stuff to him. Once it all wildlife related, um, but it's just it's just never. Uh, it's I don't know. It's just one of those things that's just it's it's cool. I think it's freaking amazing. I love you know it just messes with my mind, right? But I 
I think when it comes, so my 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 fear is is when it comes down to post and putting it all together is where I'll lose out on. Like I just don't think I could have it in this of a year to, oh, to okay. actually make it happen. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but I, I I agree in the sense that like I don't necessarily know if that's a medium that people are like. I think a lot of people have. Uh, been like, oh yeah, we're definitely getting gonna get into virtual reality later. I just think I, I'm not completely convinced that that's like the the new technology of the future. I think there will be applications for it, but I can't. I I don't think people. I can't see people substituting like a, a pure 2D visual for throwing on a headset every time they're gonna watch TV. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like augmented reality is probably a little bit more um, yeah, realistic yeah. coming through. Like being able to see the the black panther coming out at the screen at you or where you are in the living room or something to that effect but who knows yeah i i think the four, fourth dimension is where, where it's going to be in the future not a, not having not a, uh, not um having to put on like a, a headset or anything like that yeah yeah just have that just happen straight away definitely i just want to get into some quick rapid fire questions starting out with if you could recommend any wildlife book to people, what that would be? Um, wildlife books or documentary? Oh, documentaries! I always find you know the most beautiful stuff out there is all the stuff that the BBC does. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, and there's there's just something about David Attenborough. It's just some something else. Have you seen that trailer yeah. for Dynasties or Dynasties, yeah, as he yeah, calls it? Yeah, that yeah. that I've, is going to be crazy. I literally I just came off. Um, so just before I was in Madagascar, I was on a BBC shoot for the new um, big landmark series, and uh, can't talk about that yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like the new planet so, Earth kind of thing. Some, something like that. Um, <laughs> so so it's it's really cool. Uh, but the the one that's the worst, by the way. The, like when people do, he's like, "I have the coolest thing. It's amazing. I can't tell you what it is." I'm like, "I just wish you didn't mention it at all." <laughs> no, I'm just like <laughs> wondering. Um, but the one guy that was with me on the, on the shoot, he he did all the tiger stuff and then a lot of the chimpanzee stuff. Which is really cool. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I have, I have a nice guy to work with. So, um, yeah, which which I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I'm, I'm more. I think the most excited. I'm definitely more excited about the tigers and the wild dog stuff. Yeah, the wild dog. The African wild, the African wild dogs. They're just such badasses. Oh, I'm excited to check it out. <laughs> They're just badasses. Full stop. Even more so than um, the, the Asian guys, do you see like a do you see a parallel compared to the Asian dogs? Uh, I think I think because the African wild dog is a lot bigger. Um, I don't know. I think I think they they have more. You know, they. I don't know how how would you say this? Like I find the Asiatic wild dogs, the dolls, I find. They're more full of shit. <laughs> like, like, because they, they're smaller. They're like these little dogs that just like love to cause shit. Like, I find the African wild dogs, they, they're bigger. They know they can do, you know, they can do more as, as a pack unit than, right. than what, they, I find those little ones, they just like, they're out there just to cause shit all day long. <laughs> um, they have like Napoleonic yeah, it's, it's, complex or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, they're, they're incredible animals. Uh, yeah. But I, I think it would be a dream to make a film on both of them and compare their, you know, behaviors side by side. That would be cool. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to do that. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, okay, so book wise, I don't know. I grew up reading Wilbur Smith's books. They're just like fairy tale stories on Africa. And I always loved those. Wilbur um, Smith. Yeah, Wilbur Smith. They, um, he puts a lot of research into his um, fictional stories, but um, a lot of the research he's done is he's 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 actually taken it from life events and things like that, and just molded into his books. And oh, cool. It, yeah, it's. I think you know, especially about Africa, it makes Africa very dreamy. Um, 
but yeah, very cool. I, I, I like the I like the research he's put into it. Um, but then uh, I'd say in terms of books, if you ever had to buy a great present, I'd say there's a organization called Remembering Wildlife, and they've just done their Remembering Great Apes book. Yeah, I'm sure you've seen yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, we've had so, um, I'd say, Margot Ragged on the podcast. Uh, Oh, Who fantastic. Puts those I'd say, I'd, yeah, yeah, fantastic. I love this stuff. And I'd say if there's books, I think it's a book with a cause, which I like. Yeah. I think that's um, what, what I really like the most about it. I think it's a very so, provocative yeah. title, too, in the sense of like remembering elephants, remembering great apes. It's kind mm. of the point that you were saying we were talking about in Madagascar is like mm. remembering them before they're gone and hopefully will get people yeah. kind of motivated to start saving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I think if there's any book you could buy, I like the fact that it, you know, hundred hundred percent goes back into into conservation and all of that. So it's a it's a fantastic idea, and um, it's nice seeing a bunch of photographers all over the world, um, you know, contribute to something like that. Yeah, definitely. I'll tell you something. So I've got a, I've got a shot in one of those things, uh, the Great Apes book. Oh really? But it's a it's a it's a frame grab from the video file footage. Oh really? No way. Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't. No one would know. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, but I mean that's the so, point, right? I mean, if you had these things shooting, like how many frames per second are you shooting at? I think that was like at sixty frames or something like that. Nothing. Yeah. You know, oh, even that slow. Wow. Yeah. The yeah. cameras are just like so ridiculous at this point in time. Yeah, it's it's amazing, but it's I find it amazing that you can pull a video frame and still goes to print. I <laughs> know, and like for a book, and she she like just talking to her. She gets like everybody wants to be in that book because it's such a. I mean, it's such an important cause, and it's really the best yeah. of the best are getting in that book. So that's that is such a funny thing saying that it's a screen grab from there. I I, I say I cheat with, with my photography because <laughs> because like, I've got pre record, I've got all of that. I've been, I can choose from you know hundreds of frames every second. It, it's like. Yeah, it's nuts. What would you say is the scariest moment you've ever had in your career? I've had um, a few, few very close ones with with elephant, particularly elephant, um, and then I've had uh, I've had yeah some pretty pretty nerve wracking moments with lions on foot, um, but it's it's all stuff that I've been able to. I think if I didn't understand what the animal, you know, what was going on mm-hmm. in that situation, I, I think it, it would have definitely been a, I don't think we would have been talking right now. <laughs> right. Yeah, if I, if I don't know how to handle that um, the way I did. But uh, like I said, like it, it all came down to understanding that animal at the time and what was happening and uh, how should I react at, at this moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... There's been, you know, there's there's been moments like that, but but mostly elephant, elephant have always been, um, and then there's been some stupid things, you know, with venomous snakes and getting bitten and things like that. But that's that that's, yeah, I kind of Shannon, Shannon's kind of banned me from picking up venomous snakes now. <laughs> Understandably so, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How about the the most beautiful? Like, is there one moment that sticks out in all your travels that you're just like I can't. In the moment, you're like I can't believe I get to do this for a living. Every time I see that black panther, yeah. Every single time I see it. Every time I see it, and it's not just it, it's that it's that forest. Every time I see an animal in that forest, it just blows me away. Like when I see a leopard in it, when I see a tiger in it, all of it just just blows me away. That's um, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah, it's it's nuts. Yeah, hands down, one of the most beautiful places I've ever set foot into. And when can people expect that film? You said end of twenty nineteen. Yeah, end of next year. Any other projects that people should be aware of going on? I mean, I'll, I'll link everything to your Instagram and website, yeah, all, like, uh, all in the show notes. But anything else people should be aware of? Uh, following year, there will be a so there will be the BBC shoot that I was recently on, um, and then. I, it, everything's a blur. Oh, yeah, this Nat Geo shoot I've just done, done in Scandinavia. I go back and do the winter section of it early next year. Um, that comes out, I think, in July. So that's pretty soon. And then 
And then uh, the big Disney nature feature will be out in 2020 on Earth Day. Oh, all cool. over the world at, this, oh. at, at cinemas. So I worked on, on that, which is a big film. And, and um, it's going to be their big feature film. So, yeah, I think it's always in April. Earth Day is in April. Oh, awesome. So if I remember correctly. Okay. So you can look out for that. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll find as much as I can and link it in the show notes for people. But I'm assuming if they follow on Instagram and stuff, there will be little notices of when that stuff drops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're definitely make a few notices on it. Yeah, awesome. And uh, my last question is, if you could put a billboard on the side of a major highway, Los Angeles, New York, uh, anywhere in the world, that could disseminate one message in 10 words or less, what would that be? Mm. I'll tell you something that I did do. (laughs) Shannon and I made a video that we wanted to you know, catch a bit of attention. And within the first 24 hours, it had 6 million views. What? Since then, it's had over billions of views just on Facebook, social media, you know, internet, and all of that. Um, it was an elephant that picked up rubbish and put in a dustbin. And I just titled simple, like, you know, if animals can do it, why can't we? Wow. I definitely have watched so, that before. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was a black was and you. white video. It was, it was a black and white video of, of an elephant picking up rubbish and putting it in a dustbin. How did you find that? Is that something you knew that that animal was doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we knew about it, but we just wanted a message behind, behind that. Wow. And just, just put it up. So it was actually it was actually filmed on a regular GoPro and we just edited it like so it looked like it was caught on a CCTV camera. We because all we wanted was this message to get out there. Right, right. So yeah, yeah. What does so it feel really like cool. to have a video go that crazy viral? That must be very interesting. I I need to check up on it. Like I I've just lost interest. Like I, I'm glad it's done that. That's, yeah. That was the goal yeah. and like. I'd love to do more of those. I just got to think of some cool ideas and find some cool things, angles and you know, little stories we could work on and you know, potentially make it happen. Hell yeah. Um, but um, I, I, I don't know. I just think, you know, this world's a mess. And I think uh, if there's anything I could put on a billboard or write on a billboard is that we just need to look after this place and we're not. Yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely not looking after it at all. It's 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 terrible. Yeah. Unfortunately, well, that's a sad reality. But um, you know, you know, it, I I feel like there is a change happening in this world. There is a, there is a, a massive change happening, especially in first world places. Um. So. Yeah. Let's just hope. Yeah. Let's just start to bigger yeah. things. I agree, and I think if anybody listening wants to learn a little bit more about spectacular animals that are worth protecting. You have to go check out Russ's stuff. I'll link it again in the show notes. It is genuinely like, I don't, it's unbelievable. Like I'm just, I'm obsessed. (laughs) Uh, You and your wife just create the the most beautiful work and super excited to watch the, the black leopard film. I mean, I think it's so interesting. That's such a, like the most popular animal in the entire world has really only been reduced to like photos and stuff at this point to see a full feature film on it is going to be more than spectacular. So I'm super stoked to be at the time to do this. I definitely want to do it again because I keep notes by me that things I want to talk about. And I like, I have to keep yeah, these fantastic. things under four hours because like people, <laughs> people don't want to listen to things for four hours, but I could keep going on and on for days. So hopefully we can get together again, but thank you so much for taking the time. Anytime, man, anytime. And, and yeah. for everybody listening, I'll, I'll link all this stuff in the show notes and until next time, stay wild. Thank you so much for listening. I honestly cannot express how much I appreciate you taking the time For all information regarding this episode's guest, social channels, books, how you can support, etc., please check out our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please, please, please subscribe to the podcast. We are everywhere that you can find podcasts. Subscribe to Escape the Zoo on YouTube, follow Escape the Zoo on Instagram, like Escape the Zoo on Facebook, 
and please share with your friends. It honestly goes so far and means so much to me. And lastly, if you'd like to be emailed with each new podcast and any other major Escape the Zoo updates, visit escapethezoo.tv and sign up for our email list. Thank you.